10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Hack, it's two nine past the hour. Today's mission as fragged is uh, area defense. Objectives of today are very specific. Uh, number one, we're gonna go out there and attempt to detect all the uh, factor bandits that are out there and then uh, put a radar on them to identify them early on. The single most important factor, the type of training that we do is dependent upon the threat. How sophisticated the threat is, what are their capabilities. It takes a lot of training uh, to be a winner in ACM because it's a, it's a very dynamic situation. We have to maintain our, uh, our edge at all times to be, be combat ready and uh, mission ready at any time to go. Fighter pilots and their aircraft have one purpose, to gain control of the space above and the territory below, land or sea. The fighter pilot and his craft, man and machine, have evolved into an integrated unit with the sole objective of addressing that purpose, that mission. To be successful in this assigned mission, the need to orchestrate the pilot with his aircraft is singular and primary. Here then is the story we tell, the making of a fighter pilot. All military training is based on a calculated response to a predictable enemy. With the lessening of tensions between the major powers, new priorities for aerial combat must be addressed. There is a growing focus on limited regional conflicts or dirty little wars between fighters of different types and eras. Now scores of fourth generation fighters from the world powers may confront hundreds of earlier generation machines in the hands of second tier nations including aircraft of U.S. design and manufacture. The task, distinguish friends from foe. Attack multiple targets with beyond visual range missiles. Use guns in close. Manage advanced radar and electronic warfare gear. Do it all in seconds at sustained G levels and push pilots to their physical limits and fly the complex Mach 2 airplane from a cockpit containing hundreds of controls, switches, and displays, requiring the pilots to make thousands of split-second decisions. The way the fighter pilot and his aircraft evolved between World War I and the Vietnam conflict seems, in hindsight, easy to describe in the context of war. But as the 20th century ends, air warfare is changing yet again. Now, in the split-second world of Mach 2 closing speeds and higher, pilots can't wait for the merge to attack. They have radars and weapons that make a kill more certain, and in any quadrant, including head-on. Their workloads are so intense that without the technology of a modern cockpit, they could not fly or fight. The technology of the aircraft designed for aerial combat will evolve further in the next century. To more fully appreciate the training of the man, it's necessary to understand the technology of the machine he flies. This is the pilot's view looking forward through the windscreen from the cockpit of an F-16. What you see is the HUD, or head-up display. 
It presents everything the pilot needs to see to fly and make a kill. Precious seconds otherwise spent looking down at instruments, adapting the eyes to focus and to light level, is now spent looking outside, alert to a potential threat. With the kill coming in as little as 10 seconds, sometimes less, there is no time to look inside his cockpit. Another key piece of the modern fighter cockpit is HOTAS, an acronym meaning hands on throttle and stick. This lets the pilot manage every aircraft or weapon task without removing his hands from either throttle or stick. Micro switches let him take any action he needs. The HUD, combined with HOTAS, lets the fighter pilot control his destiny and win the fight. All weather, day or night, that's a part of the fighter pilot's challenge. New displays, such as land turn, or low altitude navigation and targeting infrared. Displayed on the HUD, land turn gives pilots a day bright window to look through. For terrain avoidance, coupled with TFR, or terrain following radar, and for target acquisition. For enemy forces, there's nowhere to hide. FLIR, forward looking infrared, is yet another tool that lets a pilot acquire and kill a target that's radiating heat, like this T-38. The data required come up on the lantern display we saw a moment ago on the airplane's HUD. HUD displays, based on computer technology, have become integral to the air battle. No modern fighter can win without the best and most complete information displayed so that the pilot has continuous, real-time situational awareness. Remember those words, situational awareness. They are the key to a pilot's life or death. What's happening? Where are the threats? What are the weapon's envelopes? Can I kill? Am I vulnerable? Where is the danger coming from? The pilot must know what's going on, outside and inside, and the HUD tells him. With flight data, with radar data, with lock-on confirmation when he has a target in his sights, in every essential element of flying and fighting, the answers are there on the HUD. Kill, Jumbo, that guy's dead. And electronic protection, such as radar warning receivers and jammers, and flares to foil heat-seeking ground-to-air or air-to-air -air missiles, are built into the fourth-generation fighters of all nations. We've seen the machines that are designed to answer the threat of combat in the air. Now look at the men and the training study and experience required of these men to become fighter pilots and fly these machines. Captain Rick Ludwig, a Vietnam combat pilot in the F-4 Phantom and later Top Gun Skipper. Well, the Navy's philosophy on, on training for air combat maneuvering is a building block approach where you start with the very basic skills and uh, learn them and practice them repeatedly and then start building on those bases. Uh, very much like going through college to a master's degree to a postgraduate degree. An individual in a squadron will start off with the basic skills of one versus one maneuvering. Uh, then he'll build upon that and go uh, add some complexity with two versus two, then uh, two versus many or four versus many, and then trying to put that into a realistic scenario against a realistic threat. And probably the most important part of that, I think, is to do it on a repeated basis again and again and again uh, so we gain the experience because they are very, very perishable skills. You can get away from it for a couple of weeks at a time and, and actually drop back in your capability. The Navy has a unique and well-planned method of training their pilots, giving them experiences as close to the real thing as possible. It's called the Adversary Program. Captain Ludwig. Well, the Navy has a, uh, a fairly significant adversary program and, uh, with adversary squadrons, and their responsibility is to train up our fleet fighter squadrons. They fly the adversary aircraft like the A4, F5, or F16, 
Uh, they are trained to simulate Soviet or third world tactics and they will put together programs that they will give to fleet fighter squadrons, not only academics, but very extensive flying programs to enhance the whole squadron's proficiency to go out and uh, do air combat maneuvering. In our business, uh, I think that something that holds very, very true is that you can never, ever be satisfied with your pre professional skills. Uh, Any time that you think you're satisfied with your professional skills, it's probably time to go seek different employment because you can never be good enough. Commander Dave Jackson, commanding officer of Fighter Squadron 2. At this point in time, our ACM training consists of um, a gearing up for deployment that's going to occur here within the next uh, four to six months. And in all this uh, training, we have to maintain our, uh, our edge at all times to be, be combat ready and uh, mission ready at any time to go. So right now what we're doing is we're maintaining the edge that we've already trained up in over the last four months and trying to put it all together and uh, be the whole fighter pilot for the entire time for this training period so that when we deploy, we're the best we're going to be. Commander Steve Gaylor, Executive Officer of Fighter Squadron 1. When we're deployed um, during the daytime sorties, uh, we save a certain amount of gas during those sorties to devote to uh, maintaining those skills and we'll maybe devote maybe one to two minutes on each sortie just to maybe do one engagement and uh, to keep those skills up. Lieutenant Bud Martin, fighter pilot with Squadron 2. After every training period, a, uh, an air crew feels like they have uh, just relearned a lot of the basic skills, plus hopefully everybody's going to bring back something new. And uh, it absolutely a lot more confident than they were initially. Uh, the problem with ACM is a perishable skill. and uh, the first part of it generally is relearning some of the old mistakes and then uh, and after that if you can uh, if you can learn something new uh, you come back and feel like you you've really accomplished something professionalism in the science and art of air combat maneuvering to train the man to a peak level of skill and confidence in the use of a flying machine that perhaps has reached the highest order of technological complexity and prepare him for that mission upon the outcome of which he is ready to stake his life. Here now, the Navy fighter pilot's training mission. Every mission has a little bit different liable risk. Uh, do I have to stay and kill? Do I defeat this guy and stay and kill? Or do I just need to negate him and then get away? Uh, is the mission accomplished now? Do I have to stick around? say within the last two, 10 years, it has evolved into a very sophisticated art. You have to be very intelligent to go out there and to uh, decisively win consistently in battle. This mission is a 2v2, two F-14s against an A-4 and an F-16. A two-man crew, the pilot and radar intercept officer, or Rio. The F-14 has the eyesight advantage in the fight. Maybe they're turning. Now on 330, two contacts. Clean. All right, there we go. Loner, one, one zero, 28, Angels 24, two. Two same. Set left. Turn it on. Two sorted. One sorted. Okay, there it's split. Okay. We got the left guy. You're down at 21 miles. Understand both sorted. Okay. Like one no way to see circle. Hey, firm sorted. Fox one from two. Fox one one. Fox one two. Left. 18 miles. Okay, there's 30. 35. 40. Steady up. 12 miles. 12 miles. Angels 21. Come back. Blue spike. Roger, I think we got the A4. 
Roger. We got the A4 timing. I think so. Formation. They were stat we were spread with the left guy. Eight miles. Threat sector, two o'clock. Threat sector what? Two o'clock. Okay, what altitude is he at? Sixteen. Okay, the diamond's in the dirt. Where is my not stacked right? Five miles. Two o'clock high? Two o'clock low. Twenty low now. DC is at four. At fourteen, uh, fourteen thousand. Two miles. Anybody? Fight's on, fight's on. Fight's on. Lawrence, uh, blind. Which way? I don't know. We're there, right? Oh, that's blind, no joy. I got nobody. Oh, the gear is 16. There. Alright, I got Tommy 2 to the right. Tommy 1, blue going back. Yeah, 16. Look at the eight down low. I'm looking for him. Yeah. The mission of a fighter pilot is probably the most difficult thing you can, you can do in the world. When you go into the uh, six degrees of freedom in the, the three-dimensional world, it takes a long time to master uh, being able to do things uh, you know, on your back, uh, upside down, under six Gs, seven Gs, nine Gs, and some capable aircraft. Back on base, the pilots debrief using their HUD tapes and their memories to recall the day's mission. Approaching the merge. Got the F-16 on the nose. We get a tally about eight miles, and uh, and hear your drop lock call. So we're trying to talk your nose on to, uh, or talk your eyes on to our uh, our bandit out there. But if memories aren't enough, pilots and instructors also have the option of reliving their mission exactly as it was flown. These screens, designated Tactical Air Combat Training System, or TACS by the Navy and Air Combat Maneuvering Instrumentation, or ACMI by the Air Force, are replaying data collected from the day's training missions. The information has been recorded through this pod mounted on the wingtip. The pod sends signals to ground antenna for processing, describing everything the aircraft is doing, altitude, attitude, airspeed. It can even distinguish between the friendly aircraft, shown in green, and the enemy bogies, shown in red. At the ground station, the aircraft behavior is tracked in detail and displayed on computers to tell instructors what's going on and to enable the pilots to debrief later, see what they did, how they were able to kill or were themselves killed. The latest ACMI TAC systems can show 64 aircraft at once. You know, ACM is such a dynamic environment that uh, probably 90% of the pilots that you would bring back from a flight could not sit down and, and go up to the board and choreograph what they did during that particular engagement. And a tax affords us the ability to go back, uh, simulate missile shots, uh, which essentially you can't do without tax. Uh, it also gives you the ability to, to run the whole engagement through. You can stop the tape uh, and show where guys made the mistakes, where they could have capitalized on uh, their counterparts' mistakes. Uh, 
it's an invaluable tool in today's uh, ACM arena. Lieutenant Bud Martin, fighter pilot with Squadron 2. The engagement we did this morning was a two versus two. It was myself and a wingman against an F-16 and an A-4. And we, uh, we did an intercept into the merge from uh, about 30 miles. We got to the merge and uh, we, I'll use my hands here, we came in, we're the, uh, the fighters here, basically had a bracket on the two, uh, the bogeys coming in. The F-16 passed me close aboard and saw my wingman and uh, started turning towards him. The, uh, the F-16, which is a great turning airplane, just put on a uh, really hard turn, nose high, and uh, my wingman didn't pick him up until uh, the F-16 already had angles on him. And the A-4 came through the fight, but wasn't a factor at the, at the time. So I, went, I was trying to shoot the F-16 from my, uh, from my wingman's position. I went up after the F-16. We're both up there. Uh, the F-16 just looped around me and was still pressing my wingman. So I turned and tried to cut the F-16 off at the pass. And uh, I actually did basically a split us coming through. The A-4 was happened to be on my wingman's nose at the time, so it really worked out well uh, that my wingman could come around and shoot the A-4 while I dug down and uh, took a shot, a, a sidewinder shot at about a mile and a half on the F-16. So it all, it probably happened in about 30 seconds, 35 seconds. Commander Gary Barrett, commanding officer of the adversary squadron 127 here at the Naval Air Station, Fallon, Nevada. Generally, the Navy adversary pilot, uh, his, his primary tasking is to keep the fight safe. Uh, we have specific training rules that have to be adhered to in ACM engagements. And before the adversary even becomes the adversary, he has to always function as the umpire in the fight. Uh, it takes two to fight anytime you uh, start one. And if the adversary knocks it off, you can quit often uh, in time to avoid uh, unpleasant occurrences, departures, getting too low, just keeping the fight safe. Uh, once the safety aspect of the fight is assured, the adversary driver's job at that point is to provide an adversary, an adversary that flies threat tactics, an adversary that attempts to think like the threat, an adversary that uses weapons envelopes that are comparable to threat weapons, threat missiles. Uh, providing the Navy attack air pilot with a view of what we would expect to see in the real world from the other side. Uh, having seen it in training, it's much easier to do a good job in combat. So for the adversary, you really have two jobs, yes. You have to think like an adversary, and you have to use adversary tactics, and you have to give it your best shot. I mean, we try to beat them, and uh, if they shoot us, that's all well and good, because that's how it's supposed to come out. If we do our job right, we lose. If we win, then there are some discussion points that need to be brought out. Uh, and all the time this is going on, the primary mission is to be sure that the evolution and training is safe. The adversary squadron, the highly trained and highly skilled professional instructors that concentrate on becoming an accurate profile of a potential enemy. Their success in this undertaking is measured by their losing the fight. Here is a mission from the adversary's point of view. A 2v2, two F-14s against two F-16s. JB. Two eight zero thirty three angels uh, high. Thirty one miles. 24,000. JP. Looks like they might be stacked. Starting to break out too now. JP. A little bit of line out left. Yep. There's a mile and a half. Yep. Twenty-six miles, the right one's at twenty-four thousand. Twenty-four miles. Like co altitude, uh, 24 miles. <laughs> 22 miles now. 
to have that line out left. Trouble okay. targeted. 19 miles, I'm coming left for the shot. Uh, mile and a half, skip. Yep. 14 miles now. 25,000 uh, feet. Yep, it's tally two on my nose. Roger, jungle's tally one on your nose. Flow. Jungle's tally two. Looks like they're running on you. Roger, I'll mark the uh, low guy. Okay, I got tally two. Just tell me which one you're going for. Go over the far guy. I don't know. No, they're not. Go to the left hand guy, the trailer. Okay, you're taking the trailer. Fight on, fight on. and clear. The student still has something to learn. Commander Mike Zoka, commanding officer of Squadron 126, the Bandits. Number one is to take care of the student. We fight people with 100 hours in the jet, 1,000 hours in a jet, 2,000 hours in a jet. And we don't know what their flight time qualifications or experience level are when we fight them. So my number one responsibility and prime concern is to take care of that guy in that airplane. Don't let him do something screwed up with his airplane. And secondly, my job is to teach him to kill me. And if he does that, well, I die, but I feel good because he learned something. And if he makes a mistake, then it's my job to show him where he made his mistake and how to make it correct the next time he sees that situation. Lieutenant Commander Stan O'Connor, executive officer at Top Gun. Most important thing that we want our students to take away from an exercise are the lessons learned from that exercise. It's, if they've done something extremely well, then we want to highlight that in the uh, debrief. If they've had problem areas, then we want them to be able to recognize those problem areas and address them and correct them for the next flight. And that's the most important thing that they, uh, they need to take away from it. It's not so much the win or lose, although we want them to win out there and have that winning attitude but it's the ability to remember the fight, to be able to reconstruct the fight, analyze every aspect of the fight, every turn, 
that they have gone through in that, uh, in that particular engagement and be able to draw lessons and learn from that, not only for themselves, but also to teach others in their squadron. The fighter pilots of the U.S. Marine Corps are also trained within the Navy training program. Colonel Manfred Reach, commanding officer of Marine Aircraft Group 11 and Group 70. The Marine Corps mission overall, of course, is a Marine Air Ground Task Force that can be employed in a variety of scenarios uh, by the National Command Authority. As far as uh, the use of the F-A-18 in the Marine Corps is concerned, it's both a close air support airplane and a uh, air defense airplane. We cannot afford single mission uh, aircraft uh, because we're a relatively uh, small organization and as a result the F-A-18 is used in both roles and uh, it depends upon the threat scenario how the airplane is employed whether we employ it strictly as a close air support airplane or if we employ it as a combination strike fighter where it can drop bombs support the marine on the ground and also provide air defense for the uh, MAGTAF commander. Here, the F-A-18 Hornet in a Marine Corps air combat training mission. Lieutenant Colonel George Stewart, commanding officer of Rain Fighter Attack Squadron 314. As you get into a combat situation, <coughs> as best history can tell us, and our present training tells us, you're going in with an, an overall game plan, something that you want to execute. You'd like to stay with that game plan, but uh, enemies being enemies, you don't know what they're going to do. They, they don't publish their plan. Uh, unknown rider, unknown rider, position 321 north, 11741 west. This is the IP Air Defense Sector on guard. CRP unknown rider. So you need to be able to fluidly react or modify your plan for the situation that you're actually presented with when you get there. Stack left formation, uh, up clock in the uh, leader. Second right. 15 miles. At your trailer at 15 miles. There's a large difference between uh, an airplane that's uh, 2,000 feet behind me and is rapidly closing, uh, or an airplane that's a mile behind me uh, and seems to be stagnated out there. And my response to each of those is different. And it needs to be different because the threat is actually different. His weapon selection is going to be different. My most effective maneuver is going to be different. Again, it's the reason why it takes a lot of training to, to instinctively be able to look at that and respond correctly. Valley one. Jack one over top. Right here. Tally the trail. Um, from a nose back on clock level. Compare cleared to fire. Box two on the trail. Tally two. Tally two. Tally two. Okay. Well, probably two. Circle with the trailer. Circle with the lead. Trailer is good. Visual, let's go ahead and bug there, Cooker. Checking uh, 120. Roger, I got to engage here. Uh, brown, uh, Kaffir. Come back left. Roger, visual. Plot. Who go join? Visual, no join. Box to Kapir, uh, Brown Kapir. Visual, no choice. Box to Kapir, nose high, kill. Oh, hey, visual tally. Come out and roll back right. Go ahead and bug towards the east. ACM is, uh, uh, is a real complex environment. It's very, very lethal. It's very quick. Uh, it is literally the, me the uh, difference in uh, a few seconds can make between winning and losing a fight. Uh, the, to a degree, for a newer pilot, uh, there's a, the, with the sophistication of a present airplane, uh, or any of the newer airplanes, it's kind of like being a uh, concert pianist or something. Uh, if you hit the, you, you almost touch type it. So that if, it, if you hit the wrong button at the wrong time, uh, you don't get the desired result, and you've got to be feel like you're part of the airplane. 
you can you notice that difference uh, even if somebody lays off for uh, they go on leave for two weeks they will feel a little bit behind what they were where they were two weeks prior if they're uh, for a few days it'll come back very quickly but uh, uh, the initial habit pattern has always got to be refreshed the United States Air Force has a different job than the United States Navy it has different aircraft and operates in different ways. But the basic challenge of training the Air Force fighter pilot to combat readiness to kill and to win remains the same. Colonel George Mulner and the Air Force's program for fighter pilot training. Well, I think generally our, our, our philosophy is one to use a building block approach that starts uh, when folks come out of pilot training and, and for that matter out of navigator training in the case of our crew aircraft. Uh, it's based upon uh, building on a, a foundation in starting in basic aircraft maneuvering that starts all the way back in lead-in fighter training in the AT-38. It helps build situational awareness and we get into the training in the aircraft unique systems that starts in our RTU program. This develops proficiency in the system. Uh, fire control system, uh, the basic hardware they're going to be flying, also the proficiency to get maximum performance maneuvering out of the aircraft that they'll be flying. Colonel Steve Mosier, Vice Commander of the 49th Tactical Fighter Wing at Hollerman Air Force Base. We take the, the, the pilot, the young pilot or a pilot coming back from recurrency, and we make sure he is capable of flying the airplane. He's got to be safe, he's got to be proficient in just maneuvering the airplane. He has to know his weapon systems. He has to be able to employ those. Uh, we have missions that are trained uh, or designed to do nothing but that. The next thing we'll do is put him out 1v1 against a similar airplane with an instructor or supervisor to make sure that uh, he understands uh, the situation he's in and is proficient. Uh, then we'll go for a bigger program and we'll put two airplanes against one uh, and finally are working up to 4v4, 6v8, larger packages. We do that and we don't move from one step to the other until we're comfortable that, that he is capable of, of executing the lower level missions and then we grow ourselves up to the, uh, to the more complex uh, activities. We like to fight the similar aircraft uh, because uh, they have different habit patterns, they have different capabilities, and they represent the threats. Uh, and I guess uh, in the war of Vietnam, uh, we fought MiGs. Uh, frankly, they were no better airplanes than we flew, but their characteristics of performance were different. The way their pilots flew was different. We were surprised in some regards. We don't ever want to be surprised again. We need to examine the bounds of, okay, this is what he has, this is what we can do, and this is what we think he'll do, and we have to prepare ourselves for all those eventualities. Dissimilar air combat training in the Air Force generally pits F-15s against F-16s and T-38s, simulating the enemy. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Nida commands a squadron of T-38s at Hollerman Air Force Base, New Mexico. When we do dissimilar air combat training with other units, it's very important that uh, we keep our mindset correct. In structuring the missions we fly, uh, we look primarily at our, at our limitations, and that's, that is the fact that we're a very unsophisticated airplane, a day VFR type fighter, uh, very similar to the, uh, the MiG-21. So in those respects, we plan our tactics to try to arrive at the visual uh, fight, or the merge we call it, alive. Uh, in doing so, we present a, a multi-aircraft uh, presentation to stress their radar picture, to try to confuse them. And once we do get within the 10 mile radius, is to hopefully have somebody there that is unseen. Uh, once we get within the, uh, the visual fight, it becomes pilot versus pilot to try to uh, either uh, take advantage of, uh, of, of their lack of experience and try to hope and try to gain some uh, advantage over their obvious aircraft superiority to us. We join Captain yeah, Mike Holmes, who is briefing his pilots on an advanced training mission. It will be Five, four versus four. four. Three, that is four F-15 Eagles one, flying against an aggressor force 43. of four T-38s. Okay. 44 F-15s and T-38s, I'd like everybody to remember, uh, and for you guys, there's a little more pressure on us than normal, and then we could be doing this in two weeks against fish beds in Iraq instead of doing it here against you guys. And so we're taking it seriously. And 
Uh, we're keeping AIM-7s out of it because we want to force a turning fight and we want to force a visual fight where we have to find the smaller airplanes before they find us after we jump on one guy. So everybody remember that as we go. The overview, we'll check in everybody on 297 one to do the larger scenarios and get at least four eagles out there together so we can work on the teamwork not just of a two ship or a two plane working together but combining that into four aircraft now we have four guys working the radio four guys working the radar and trying to make that happen We like to have at least four targets so that we have to test our radar skills and our lookout skills. Today's scenario was built around T-38, simulating basically a MiG-21. We wanted to make them come up at high altitude where our airplane has a performance advantage. And then we wanted to force them into a turn and fight so we could practice flying against that smaller airplane, fighting one guy while you try to find the next guy who's jumping into the fight. We had one radar that didn't work in the flight, which unfortunately was mine. So we did some switching around in rolls, and we switched leads around. And now the number three guy, my number three, ends up with the lead of the fight. And his radar and the other guy's radars take us into the visual environment against the T-38s. My first merge on today's fight, I was flying on the wing of my number two man who has a lead because he's got the good radar. My first pickup on the T-38s was a visual pickup as they flew over the top of us. He flew over the top of my airplane and started a conversion down. And because we're at high altitude, my airplane has a maneuver and intake, and his doesn't. I've got a thrust advantage. And so I was able to turn my speed initially into some turn rate. And pretty soon, I'm driving an offensive advantage, although I traded some airspeed to do it. And we ended up going around about two 360s and 20,000 feet while I'm working to get in position to use my gun. And because my radar didn't work, I want to get in close because my sight's not going to be as accurate, and I want to make sure I'm close so the bullets are actually going to hit him if I shoot. So 
I drive back to a position behind him. I unload my airplane to get the energy I need to go up to him because he's trying to go high, higher than I can get, and hold me off from getting there. So I get a few extra knots of airspeed, and then I pull up with him. I'm able to point at him, and now he has to come down. And I've got the thrust advantage. So once he starts coming down, I'm driving the fight, and I'm able to saddle up behind him for a gunshot and finish that engagement. Ready, combat ready and again I'll break that down into a couple of reasons I've been doing the same job every day for seven years and I've had the benefit of all the schools that the Air Force offers in air combat training starting with undergraduate pilot training through F-15 school into an operational unit off the fighter weapons school to become an instructor in tactics and the weapons that we use in the airplane but the most important part is I've had seven years of doing this job every day day after day after day so in the split seconds that are available to make a decision. One, I've got good habit patterns built because I've been able to practice them every day, day after day after day. And two, when the split second decision comes up, I've probably seen it before. I've been in enough fights and I've been in the air long enough that when something happens, it's probably not the first time I've seen it. And so I probably have already thought through what I'm gonna do here and that gives me a half a second or a second advantage on the other guy to start maneuvering my airplane and take advantage of what happens. Highly skilled, supremely confident, intensely focused. We have seen these attributes evolve from a variety of training exercises. But how is the fighter pilot prepared for the mental and physical stress inherent in this job? One training device that serves this purpose is the centrifuge. Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Hill. Well, the centrifuge, uh, we train in the centrifuge because it allows us in a dynamic uh, G environment to teach uh, the flyers the kind of straining maneuver they need to uh, maintain consciousness while they're under G. We offer them uh, actually a couple advantages in a combat environment. Uh, first of all, uh, we teach him a very efficient strain so he's not uh, overutilizing personal energy uh, when he's in combat, uh, i.e. what we're doing is we're teaching him to do, um, uh, get maximum protection out of minimal effort. Remember on this ride, what I need you to do is concentrate on that red light, riding relaxed till you until you lose 100% of the green or 50% of the red. Once that happens, that's your key to start your strain. When you start your strain, make sure you stand on those water pedals, start tightening up the muscles, get in a good lung full of air, cut it off in the throat, give me a good three second interval using a quick air exchange. Spit it out, suck it in. Build the intensity of your strain as the G's get higher. Uh, the jets we have today in the fleet will sustain nine G's. Uh, the average pilot may be able to sustain uh, uh, somewhere between three and six G's before he strains. Uh, once he starts straining, uh, he may be able to get another uh, four, maybe even five G's out of his additional energy strain. All right, system's hot. Three, two, one. Get out, put back. Get out, put back. Get out, put back. One, two, three. Keep the muscles back. Push the pedals to the floor. Try to get the chest to stomach. One, two, all right, work it out, keep everything tight, looking good, looking good, keep the muscles tight, just a little more. All right, nice, just a little more strain. And relax, relax. Good job, sir. Good job. 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 There are some experiences that the fighter pilot cannot get in the air, short of real combat. Here, the training must be simulated. Lieutenant Colonel Stewart. The importance of simulators for a, a gun squadron, an operational squadron uh, like this one, uh, is primarily allows us to do things that we can't do, really. Uh, for instance, uh, harm missiles, uh, which work against uh, an anti-electronic warfare missile. Uh, there's nobody around that's willing to turn their radar on and let us shoot at it, and we couldn't afford to shoot the missiles if we wanted to. 
Uh, but we can simulate that very nicely. So uh, in terms of the switchology, the symbology in the cockpit, the feel that the pilot would get, it provides that to us. Early in training, when somebody's first learning the airplane, simulators are used for all phases of flight. We still use them somewhat for that, but it, primarily for the more advanced phases that we just can't do. The future of ACM is being driven by the development of new technologies. They're upgrading existing fighters like the F-14 with its D model, the Super Tomcat. The F-15 Stoll program is a precursor to the F-15 X, which will embody vectored thrust for extra maneuverability in ACM and shorter takeoff and landing rolls. They're experimenting with new maneuvering techniques, like the F-16 AFTI, agile fighter technology innovations that let the aircraft jink, side slip, or deviate from predictable flight so that future fighters can escape or attack more effectively. Captain Ludwig. The uh, F-14D is obviously a significant upgrade to the present F-14, the F-14A. It has uh, new engines, new avionics, and a new radar, and a tremendous increased capability. It not only gives us a long-range fighter capability with a heavy payload, a large payload, uh, but it'll also be able to have a strike capability that is ongoing and is evolving. And so we should have the same type of a strike capability that we see in our present-day strike aircraft, such as the F-18 Hornet. So we think it's going to work very closely and complement very nicely uh, the F-18 Hornet and the other aircraft in our carrier battle group. The continuing evolution of aerial combat has led to the establishment of new airframes for the next century, such as the ATF, or Advanced Tactical Fighter, intended for both the Air Force and the Navy. Two manufacturing consortiums are competing for the contract. Northrop and McDonnell Douglas are developing the ATF YF-23A. Lockheed, Boeing, and General Dynamics are developing the ATF YF-22A. Both are in the early stages of flight testing. Colonel Mulner. The F-15XX is a, is a slight improvement over our existing fleet of F-15s and does not bring all these new technologies. It brings marginal improvements in many areas uh, to the table, whereas the ATF brings some whole new technologies to the table. Uh, in particular, stealth uh, is a significant capability we're just now learning how to exploit. It offers the capability to negate our, our enemy's weapons engagement zones, to shrink them to the point that where we can engage him without him ever seeing us. And that's a significant uh, capability, as you might add. Uh, super cruise uh, is, is something else that we feel is going to be important because it reduces our vulnerability to threat. It allows us to get in and out, exploit the flexibility of air power, exploit the surprise in entering the engagement, and at the same time reduce our vulnerability time to the ground threats, uh, which are also significant even to the air-to-air -air player. Well, the Air Force is obviously procuring the advanced tactical fighter of the ATF. Uh, the Navy is looking at their Navy version called the Navy Advanced Tactical Fighter. Uh, they're very, very similar. Uh, the, we have been told to keep the, the aircraft similar, and particularly in areas like engines and avionics. The one obvious difference is one of them uh, lands, on two mile, lands and takes off on two miles of runway, and the other one crashes on about 300 feet of carrier deck. Uh, so obviously the structural, structural aspects of that aircraft are going to be significantly differ, different. Uh, we're probably going to have increased weight as a result of the beefed up landing gear that's going to be required for both the landing phase and the takeoff phase from the uh, carrier. Winning in aerial combat in the 21st century will take the usual mix of man and machine controlled by weapon systems technology on the one hand and pilot performance on the other. But the new keys are training and readiness. The modern fighter aircraft and its weapons are awesomely complex. The task of staying current takes professional effort of the highest order, not just in the cockpit, but in every human and technological link in the chain on the aircraft carrier. Back at the fighter base, through all the tiers of suppliers of airframes, engines, weapons, and avionics.
Every link must be tight and strong. But in the end, the success of the mission depends on the competence, the confidence, and the courage of the man in the cockpit. <laughs>